Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us here this afternoon. Um, before we get started on our today's webinar, um, I'm going to introduce our speaker, Karen Yepsen. Um, she's the program manager with CSH, which is the Corporation for Supportive Housing. Karen um, is a detailed oriented program manager with 20 years experience in legal advocacy, policy development and program administration for nonprofit organizations. Currently a program manager at CSH, Ms. Yepsen is responsible for managing the statewide referral network waitlist, provides training and technical assistance to key stakeholders and service providers, and facilitates the development of supportive housing for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities through Central and Southern Illinois. I'm so glad you can join us, and um, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, welcome, everybody. I'm so glad you could um, could join us, and, and thank you so much to um, to your organization for giving us the opportunity to talk to you today about CSH and the work we're doing on the statewide referral network. Um, as Jody said, my name is Karen Yepsen. My pronouns are she and her. I am a program manager at CSH, and my primary roles there are managing the waitlist for the statewide referral network and also building the supportive pipeline throughout central and southern, southern Illinois for individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability. I'd like to introduce my colleague, Ranti Ghosh. Um, she is with us today also. She's going to be controlling the PowerPoint because I am techno not savvy um, and also monitoring the chat. But I hope that we can make today's conversation kind of informal um, and that you feel free to jump in and participate. There's going to be a section that we're gonna to get to pretty soon where your input is definitely um, um, appreciated. So um, Ranti, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Sure, good morning, everyone. My name is Ranti Koch, my preferred pronouns are she, her. I'm a program manager at CSH um, and uh, I will be happy to be here with everyone. We'll be supporting Karen with uh, uh, you know, just monitoring the chat. Uh, so when you have questions, uh, please uh, feel free to come off mute or put your questions in the chat. Uh, we at CSH are very uh, conversational in our presentations and uh, love it when you guys provide input. Um, so with that, I'm going to go off camera and put myself on mute. And uh, Karen, did you want to, me to start sharing the slides? Yes, please. Okay. Can you see my screen? I can see your whole screen. Yep. The PowerPoint slide? Pardon me? Can you see the PowerPoint slide? Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. So, Ranti, are you in present mode? Yep, getting there. Just bear with us just a minute. There we go. So, um, Ranti, you can go on and um, move to the next slide if you would. Um, we're here today, to, excuse me, we're here today to talk to you again about um, just an introduction to the Corporation for Supportive Housing, which we, we refer to ourselves as CSH. Um, we're gonna also talk about a little bit about Supportive Housing 101. Apologies, um, uh, apologies for the interruption. Um, Karen, when I'm sharing the slides, I'm not able to ch look at the chat. So I think, uh, so maybe you would probably have to take a look at the chat along, with, or or Jody, if you could monitor the chat. Happy to do so, yep. All right, right. sounds good, thanks. Okay. okay, are you good, Ranti, then? Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so you can go on to the next slide, if you would, please. 
So we're going to talk today about CSH, a little overview of Supportive Housing 101. I do want to give you a little introduction into the Illinois Statewide Referral Network and why that might be important to you. Um, and also share some ideas and information about how that can provide some uh, possibly some new opportunities for the service partners that you work with in terms of connecting people to housing. And lastly, I just want to talk to you a little bit about how you might be able to look at creating supportive housing in your own communities by partnering with, partnering with CSH and our Illinois um, Housing Development Authority Institute. So uh, if we can move on to the next slide. This is where we, uh, this is the slide I like to call audience participation. Um, I just wanted to ask you guys um, if you would just join in this conversation. We're, we're curious to learn from you, what, what does supportive housing mean to you? Does anybody have any experience with uh, supportive housing? And it can be positive or negative. And if you have no experience at all, that's okay too. But if everybody would um, just please join in, jump jump on, feel free to go on camera or stay off, whatever is most comfortable to you. Uh, question is, is it the same as subsidized housing? That's a great question. So supportive housing can be subsidized. Yeah, there's different types of supportive housing and um, we're gonna get more into that a little bit later, but that's a great question. I have done some work with um, housing. I started out in my internship and then my first position was working with um, veterans who were either homeless or about to become homeless. So we did some supportive housing and I helped develop a supportive housing program. Great, great. So you've had a lot of experience actually. Anybody else? No, it, it's a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a big concept. And if you, if you haven't had exposure yet, that's okay, because we're going to kind of fill you in all, on all the details as, as we move along. Um, so Ronti, would you like to go to the next slide? Um, I actually, prior to coming to CSH, did have some experience with supportive housing. Um, I used to actually uh, work as a housing navigator in my former role. Um, and I, I work to find supportive housing opportunities for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities um, in the community of their choice. And these would be independent living situations. And I just wanted to share a story with you that kind of highlights the positive outcomes that supportive housing can have for people who face multiple barriers in life. Um, Daryl is a great example of that. So, so Daryl is someone that I worked with who had been um, actually living with his mom who was aging and had some health issues. Um, Daryl is about 44 years old and he has an intellectual and developmental disability and he also has some mental health challenges. So the idea of uh, his mom aging and ultimately um, requiring skilled nursing care is kind of what led the whole um, family to the to the uh, conclusion that we needed to start look for looking for some alternate independent living arrangements for Daryl. And so, one of the things that we looked at was uh, Daryl was terrified of heights, so he needed an apartment that would be on the first floor because uh, he was not at all comfortable with a high rise kind of situation. And as you can see in the picture, he also has a cat and it's his emotional support cat. Um, so that was a factor that we needed to take into consideration. Um, and we ended up finding kind of the, just the perfect apartment for him. It was in his own community. So he could continue to attend church where he had been going for years. Um, and he could be near the grocery store and, and shop at the grocery store where he was used to going with his mother. Um, and because of Daryl's intellectual and developmental disability and his um, mental health challenges, 
he did kind of need a little bit more time to complete an application. Um, and he also has some assistive technology that uh, we needed to take into consideration because of a hearing impairment. So in my work as a housing navigator for Daryl, um, I helped to secure an apartment through um, some requests for some reasonable accommodations. And those included some assistive technology in the apartment so that he had like, for instance, a, a flashing light that would go off if uh, someone came to the door because he wouldn't necessarily hear the doorbell. Um, we also had a reasonable accommodation for his cat. Um, and we were able to link him to a service provider and this is the important part, this is what makes it kind of supportive housing, right? That could assist him with the pre and post housing supports that he needed. So for instance, they would help him with his ADL skills, um, skill building. Um, they assisted him in learning a new transportation route so that he could go to his day program. And they also provided ongoing lease supports um, because that was something that he had never experienced before. And he just needed to have a little bit of a better understanding of what his rights and responsibilities were going to be as, uh, as a tenant um, and, a, and a leaseholder. So uh, that just kind of gives you an idea that, you know, now we, when we look at Daryl, we, we see that he's thriving in his new home. He's made a lot of new friends and uh, many of them are non-disabled neighbors living in his own building. And that's really kind of a demonstration of how supportive housing can really work and create positive outcomes for people. So next slide, please. We're going to talk a little bit about CSH and kind of what our mission is. And here at CSH, we basically... Our, our, our mission is to advance housing solutions as an approach to help people thrive. And we, we do this to improve the lives of vulnerable people um, and by maximizing public resources and by collaborating with partners to build strong, healthy communities. And CSH is in almost every state in the country. So we're pretty, pretty widespread. Next slide. So since our start in 1991, CSH has distributed more than $1.7 billion in loans and grants. And that translates to over 467,000 homes for people. More than 40,500 families have been housed and over 177,000 new jobs have been created. And we've lowered the cost and improved health outcomes for fragile individuals and their families. Next slide. We work to maximize public resources and we do that by strengthening partnerships within the communities and promoting integration of public services so that people have access and it's equitable and fair. Next slide. So what do we actually do at CSH? It's kind of uh, a lot, actually. <laughs> um, we have four main lines of business. Um, we do uh, provide lending to developers, um, and that's in the way of capital funds and specialty loan products. We also work in the area of policy reform and system advocacy. We also provide training and education. Um, so at CSH, we have a website and literally we have hundreds of webinars on supportive housing and development um, and they're free to access. So we have a training institute. We provide consultation and technical assistance. Um, and that's part of the branch that Ranti and I both fall under. The consulting and technical assistance is really what kind of envelops the statewide referral network system. Next slide. So back to the question of what is supportive housing? Next slide. Whenever we talk about 
supportive housing, it's really important to recognize the systemic racism that continues to impact housing today. Th this shows up in a number of different ways. And some of you may be familiar with some of this terminology, but it does show up in redlining, which is a discriminatory practice where financial institutions can withhold um, lending uh, from neighborhoods that are, I'm sorry, financial services are withheld from neighborhoods that have significant numbers of racial and ethnic minorities. It can show up also in unfair lending practices. And what that looks like is where lending decisions are based on protected traits like race, gender, or nationality. It also can um, include unfair uh, housing policy enforcement that results in applying a policy that harms a group of people with a protected characteristic more than it harms others outside of that group. And it also includes generational wealth, which contributes to the overall racial wealth gap. We also know that there's disproportionate racial groups involved in the justice, justice system and our prison complex system primarily including people of color. And we know that many people have unequal access to services and diagnosis based on their race, gender, or nationality. So understanding that helps us to move forward. And you can go on to the next slide, Ranti. Based on our research and hard data, what we know is that affordable housing combined with services that help our most vulnerable populations works. Supportive housing provides people with the stability, autonomy, and dignity we all deserve. And what do those support services look like? If you look at the wheel on this slide, it can include anything from case management to employment services, parenting, coaching, life skills, primary health services, mental health services, substance use treatment. It can be any or all of those. Um, but that's kind of what we're talking about when we, when we refer to support. And those supports are voluntary. They're tenant center and they're coordinated. So you can't force someone to accept those support services, but we know when they're offered and available to people, it really produces a more successful outcome. And the housing that we refer to when we refer to supportive housing is affordable, it's permanent, it's not temporary housing, and it's independent. Next slide. So when we talk about supportive housing, there are some key components to consider. And one of the areas that I really like to highlight in this entire list is number three, which is supportive housing provides individuals with their own lease. So they're not living under the guise of a uh, property owner that owns the unit and controls the unit and makes all the decisions within that unit. The individual is the leaseholder. Um, Housing is affordable. We've talked about that before. We've talked about the services and centering everything among the tenants um, and connecting them to their community. That's really crucial because we don't want someone disconnected. And like in the story with Daryl, what was really important was that he was able to maintain relationships that he had growing up. He was able to continue to participate in his place of worship. And he was able to go to familiar places where he was comfortable, like the grocery store and his doctor and his dentist. And we didn't need to completely uproot him and um, reestablish him in those uh, different uh, programs. Next slide. So here's what supportive housing is not. It's not a treatment model or method. It's not temporary or transitional, and it's not licensed community care, like what you'd see, for instance, in a skilled nursing facility. This is somewhere where someone has their own lease, like we mentioned before. 
Next slide. So now that we've covered what, um, what supportive housing kind of includes, um, one of the things that we talk about uh, within uh, CHA, CSH is our FUSE model, which kind of breaks the cycle of people kind of coming and going in between crises um, by really looking at what services they need, troubleshooting uh, whatever housing placement or retention barriers they may have, and providing those services in order to increase their stability and, and um, long-term success in the units where, where they're living. These are typically individuals that come and go in between services. They, they enter those services frequently and exit frequently. So this, is, uh, this model is to kind of break that cycle and create more stability overall. Next slide. So just get, just to give you an idea, when you when you kind of have in your mind's eye what supportive housing looks like, here are a couple of examples of what a supportive housing building may look like from the outside. So we have single site project based uh, supportive housing developments where everything is kind of in one location. Then we have clustered where maybe just one floor of a building may have uh, supported housing or SRN units. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as well. There's also scattered site supportive housing opportunities where um, there may be different uh, units in separate buildings in across the community, okay? Or, integrated affordable supported housing, which means it's kind of scattered. And this is kind of the instance that I talked about um, with regard to Daryl, where he's in a building and he's living with disabled peers and also non-disabled peers. So, um, you know, it's not one building that is entirely populated by individuals with an intellectual or developmental disability. Next slide. So we're really here today to talk about the statewide referral network because we see this as an opportunity to really maybe connect the service partners that you work with, with new opportunities for finding housing for the people that they're currently serving. And just to give you kind of an overview of what the statewide referral network is, it's, it's kind of a it's kind of a complex system, but it started as a partnership with four state agencies and community service providers. And the, the four state agencies include the Illinois Department of Healthcare and Family Services, the Illinois Department on Aging, the Illinois Housing Development Authority, and the Illinois Department of Human Services. And really what happens with the statewide referral network is it connects households with supportive housing through enrollment of eligible applicants into a database where they are then matched according to their pro profile to available affordable housing. And they're allowed to indicate on their enrollment form things like um, you know, according to their household size, they can indicate what size of bedroom they require, their geographical preferences. So it's really tailored to meet their needs. In Illinois, um, all affordable housing developments include a 10% set aside for the SRN. So if, for instance, um, a developer creates a building or develops a building, um, 10% of the units within that building are set aside for the SRN in order, in other words, for people from the SRN to fill those units. In rural areas, that number is a little bit lower, um, which is kind of obvious because it's just a little bit less condensed than areas like Chicago and the surrounding suburbs. And supportive housing senior developments and um, general affordable housing buildings are all included in that. 
Next slide. So you might be asking who, who, who actually is eligible for the SRN? When we're looking at um, eligibility, we look at people who earn 30% of the area median income or below and are connected to a service partner. And they also need to identify as either being in an institution or at risk of institutionalization, or they need to be experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness, or they need to be the head of a household with a disability. Next slide. When we look at how SRN rent is determined, there are kind of three main um, identifiers. We have affordable housing where rent is set to be affordable to a household earning under that 30% AMI, okay? We also have income-based housing where rent is based on annual household income and that's targeted to certain income ranges. So they may say you, ha you have to um, earn money within this range, you cannot have an income over this range. And then there's also subsidized housing where rent is typically based on 30% of the household income. Next slide. Another um, type of supportive housing or affordable housing, I should say, is uh, HUD 811. And in order to qualify for HUD 811 units, people who earn under 30% of the um, area median income are those that qualify. But they also need to be under the age of 62 and receiving Medicaid long-term services and supports or state Medicaid plan services and either in institutions or at risk of institutionalization. And this would not then include individuals who are homeless. That's kind of the distinguishing, one of the distinguishing factors between people who may be eligible for the SRN and people who would be eligible for a HUD 811 unit. All HUD 811 units are subsidized. So that's another distinction. Next slide. So when we talk about who should become a service partner and why, we, we kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier. Organizations that already have relationships with community members, and I know that you work with a lot of these service partners and who provide services already, those, those are the folks that we know will be a good fit because they have that relationship. They can continue to provide the services which are part of the SRN requirement. Um, and then they, by knowing that and having that information, they're, in, they're able to enroll people on the SRN. And this does open the door to affordable and subsidized, sometimes subsidized housing for those in need. These are opportunities that many service providers who aren't aware of this uh, statewide referral network, these are properties and units that they may otherwise not have access to. Because once a property is listed on the statewide referral network, um, as long as it's within that listing period, that unit needs to be filled by somebody from the SRN. So those applications have priority. Next slide. How do you become a service partner? If you currently know of anybody that you're working with that's providing services in the community, it's so simple to become a service partner. We offer a virtual onboarding session. Um, it, we also offer a self-paced class, um, which is a recorded session. And usually it's about an hour long. Um, I've done it uh, prior to working at CSH. It's very easy. Um, very clear, very easy to understand. And following participation in that onboarding or the recorded session, um, the service partner just completes an SRN user agreement and submits that um, to us. Usually with, uh, I'm sorry, to emphasis, at, which is the database system. And we provide all of the information on how, how to do that. 
Usually once they submit that user agreement, it takes probably about two business days to get their login credentials. And as long as a service partner logs in, and they don't even need to enroll anybody right away, but as long as they log into the system within the first 30 days, they're registered to use the SRN system to match applicants. So then they can start to enroll people um, as, as the need arises. Again, we're happy to walk anyone through this process. And our email um, is listed on this slide so that you can see how to contact us. In addition to those onboarding sessions that we offer and also the self-paced class, we do offer um, office hours. So let's say you're working with a service partner and they get a little bit confused about, okay, um, I was... I was the case manager on the SRN for an individual that I enrolled, but I'm changing my job responsibilities within the agency. And my colleague wants to be able to take over um, monitoring the individuals that have already been enrolled on the SRN. How do I go about doing that? So we, we have a very simple guide that we provide to our service partners to walk them through the steps for how to do that or they can always come to our office hours and, and we can uh, walk people through step-by-step step how to do that. That's one example of how you might need to have some additional technical assistance in terms of how to use the SRN. Um, another example might be if someone's, um, if someone, for instance, needs to uh, be paused on the SRN, maybe they've temporarily lost a job um, and so their income is changing and they just need a little bit of period of a time to, uh, to get another job and get that income reestablished. We can put individuals on pause on the SRN for a period of 90 days. Um, and you do that by contacting us as well. So those office hours, um, and that out, outreach is really there to provide the support that service partners may need along the way, because nothing ever <laughs> remains constant when you're um, when you're working with individuals, because everyone has such unique um, situations. I, I just wanted to add one thing, uh, Karen, uh, is yeah. that in addition to office hours and trainings, um, we are always available to answer questions um, or you know support in any way possible. So anytime a service partner is running into uh, issues or maybe uh, the applicant was declined and they need to appeal or submit a reasonable accommodation request, uh, they can always reach out to us. Of course, we also have like a, a website with more information on that and template letters on appeals and stuff. Uh, but then, uh, you know, they can, uh, and which we share with service partners routinely, uh, but uh, service partners are also encouraged to reach out uh, as and when they need to. And the best way to reach out to us is srn at csh.org. Um, because uh, there's a group of us that work on this project and this email goes to all of us and then any one of us can jump in to provide support. Right. Thank you for adding that, Ranti. That's that's exactly right. Um, and we welcome any questions. There's no silly question. I know some people sometimes hesitate. <laughs> they say, I'm not sure if I should even bring this to you, but it's always good just to check. So the real reason for um, wanting to talk with you today, in addition to um, uh, giving you an idea of what we do as an agency, how we're promoting supportive housing, and what we're doing in terms of our work with the statewide referral network, is because we have counties in Illinois who are desperately in need of service partners. We are def desperately in need of service partners for these counties because we have available units to fill, but we don't have enough service partners in certain areas to enroll individuals so that we can refer them into these units. And we know there's such a great need for housing. So we wanted to connect with you to see if there's a way for us to partner, to see if you know of people that you're working with now who could become great service partners with us. Um, and I wanna to talk to you a little bit about where some of these properties are 
you can see in this slide, um, there's quite a few counties where we're we're really, really, really looking for other service partners. We do work with the continuum of cares. We work for we work with the um, centers for independent living. Those are some of our current service partners. Um, but we're reaching out because we still need even more. Um, you can see from the listing on these counties, the different buildings that are available, and these are all SRN units. So when we talked before about who is eligible, if you know of a partner, a provider that you're working with that works with um, any kind of fragile population, that would be anybody that's homeless, a, a veteran, um, uh, someone aging out of foster care, I mean, you know who the vulnerable populations are out there. If you know of someone working with any of those populations and more, these are counties that have available openings and they're having trouble filling um, the units. Some of these are senior units, but not all. Um, many, many, many are family units, individual units. There's a mixture of one, two, and three bedroom units. Um, but you can see from the last two slides, this one and the one prior, this is primarily throughout central and southern Illinois. And that's why we know we really need to be working hard to build this pipeline, not only for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities, but we need to start connecting more service partners so that more people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of that um, are being connected. Next slide, please. Here's an example of some of the current openings. Um, it's a little bit out of order, but the top um, on your top left, you'll see one of the units. This is called Blue Sky Meadows. Um, this not all of these units are Blue Sky Meadows. This was my uh, faux pas in the um, slide, but the top unit is um, Blue Sky Meadows, and th this is a beautiful building that's in Havana, Illinois. Um, they've actually had two. Uh, separate units listed recently, um, and we're working very hard to find uh, at, uh, eligible applicants to fill those buildings. And you can see how well maintained and nicely kept they are. The building below is called Pine Woods Apartments, and it's located in Springfield, Illinois. So um, you can see the difference in the two buildings. One definitely is more of a single um, you know, just a single occupancy and um, the, the building below is obviously uh, more multiple apartments. On the upper right hand corner is Maple Ridge Apartments in Paris, Illinois. If any of you are familiar with Edgar County, that's where this is located. Um, this was developed by the Laborers Home Development Corporation and it's a beautiful building. Um, and the one below that is a new, new development in Bloomington, Illinois called Lincoln Lofts Phase 2. They also have one and two bedroom units available. Next slide. Again, just to give you an idea of what SRN units might look like from the outside, you can see there's no distinguishing feature that would make you say, oh, that's a building that has SRN units. They blend into the community. They're in a building just like you and I or anyone else you may know of may live in. Um, and they're, they're beautiful buildings. This is Kerwin Apartments and it's located in Waukegan. Next slide. If you ever wondered what the inside looks like, some people may have the idea of, oh, public housing. I'm not so sure that could kind of look sketchy. This is actually the inside of Lincoln Apartments in Bloomington. Uh, we've toured these buildings. They're, they're absolutely beautiful. Many, many, many of these units are updated. They have updated features. Lots of them are handicapped accessible, although not all. Um, there's parking available some in, in some buildings, there's covered parkings in others, in others, there aren't. Um, but this just kind of gives you an idea of the space. 
and what the interiors look like. Next slide. Again, more examples. This is Rolling Acres in Marion. Next. So I wanted to talk to you finally about um, create a, creating supportive housing and our, um, our institute that we, that we offer. So we've talked about the fact that there doesn't seem to be enough supportive housing in central and southern Illinois. And we're really um, reaching out to service partners who might be thinking about the concept of creating a development for supportive housing. Um, part of what we do at CSH is we offer an institute. Um, it's an IDA-sponsored, Illinois Housing Development Authority-sponsored uh, institute. And what the institute does is it helps in individuals who are kind of in the space of thinking about either creating supportive housing, or maybe they know someone else who may be interested, or maybe they're even a support service provider wondering how they can be linked to a project um, where support services are offered within available affordable housing. The Institute is designed to help people understand the core concepts of supportive housing, and that includes housing first. We know that the best practice is to get people housed and then work the services around them to approach individuals in, um, in the manner of harm reduction and also to be looking at eviction prevention for, for our really vulnerable populations. So we really focus on helping uh, potential developers or people that are even just considering understand what those core concepts are. We also help work uh, help to uh, identify what the different roles and responsibilities within development are so that each partner kind of understands how, um, how a team is built because with development, it takes a team. We help you create plans, including like, what are you going to use as your tenant selection plan? What criteria are you going to have? What types of support services are you going to need in the building? How are you gonna prevent um, eviction? How are you going to manage the property? And how most importantly, are tenants gonna be involved because this is their home. And we believe people with lived experience are the experts in supportive housing. We also help you understand financing and to kind of create your preliminary budget for the project you have in mind. And we also help you think about standards and how you want to set those and how you wanna design um, the criteria that you're gonna use for your site selection. I know that sounds alike a lot. Um, our colleague, Brett Penner is responsible for the Institute. And these are definitely fantastic learning spaces for anybody that is uh, thinking about creating supportive housing options or wants to explore it a little bit further. Next slide. We actually have an institute coming up very soon. Um, applications will be open on November 20th and responses are due by January 22nd. And we'll also be hosting an informational webinar in December to kind of go over what the application process is. For folks that attend the uh, Institute who are actually um, in the stage of developing a project, they, they, uh, they earn points from IDA for attending these types of institutes. And those points go towards their development project. But um, we're happy to connect you with Brett if you know of anyone who may be kind of in the headspace of thinking about creating supportive housing or providing support services within supportive housing. Um, so we can provide that information to you at your request. Next slide. So this is a space for any questions. I know we've really covered quite a lot today. Um, but if you have any questions, both Ronti and I are here to answer anything we can.
I think we're small enough if you want to just, you know, ask a question, feel free. This was great, by the way. Very informative, Karen. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Is anybody working currently with a service partner where you think this could be applicable, that it might help them? You know, lots of times I, I know as a navigator um, in my prior role, um, I, I looked for housing and it, it was very difficult in certain regions of Illinois. And you just felt like you were hitting your head against a wall. And I like to think that you could consider the statewide referral network as just another tool in the toolbox. It doesn't have to be the only tool, but it's a great tool. Sometimes I would work with individuals that didn't qualify for the statewide referral network because they were over income. Um, and we had to deal with other issues like there are landlords out there that are asking for three times the monthly rent and income in order to just apply. Um, part of what we can do through CSH is help you get linked to uh, reasonable accommodations. There are rules out there now that provide guidance. HUD is providing guidance on that income requirement. They also provide guidance on um, credit checks, criminal background um, checks. So we have a wealth of resources we would love to share, but I'm just curious if anyone currently works with anyone where you think that the statewide referral network may help them, may be another avenue for them to take to help them link their individuals to affordable housing. Lynn, I see you're on camera. Did you have anything to add or? No, I I am on your mailing list for years and years and years. And I appreciate the training content that comes out that's available. It's I don't usually directly engage. Um, and I'm not sure how much the other partners in this community are engaging. So fingers crossed. I mean, we've we've had meetings before and tried to make it work, but Let's see. Yeah. And what area do you do you cover? Champaign. I'm sorry? Champaign County. Champaign County. Yeah. So my primary responsibility is managing referrals for properties throughout central and southern Illinois. And I have quite a few properties in Champaign. Quite a few. Yeah. So. Anybody else? Yes, that's what I know you are doing central and southern Illinois. I'm wondering what the landscape is in Cook County and if there's a shortage of partners here, because I, I know housing is a nightmare in this area. So I would be yes. interested to know if there is a shortage. Yeah, and my my colleague Ronti can actually speak to that because that's kind of her service area. So as waitlist administrators, I'll just preface it with this. We have kind of divided the state up so that we can better manage the referrals in our distinct areas. Um, so I'm central and southern Illinois and Ronti, if you wanna join in, um, you can kind of give them an idea of the areas that you cover. And we have another colleague, Jessica, who's not on this call right now, um, but Ronti can fill you in a little bit more on that. That's a great question. Thank you. Yeah, so usually I'm kind of managing the referrals for northern part of Illinois. So Kane County, Will County, DuPage, um, one of the counties up on top. And then uh, I also manage the referrals for the new constructions, both in northern Illinois as well as Cook County. And then our colleague, Jessica Smith, uh, she manages the turnover units in Cook County, as well as the HOT 811 uh, units. Uh, so I think uh, both Karen and I just work with SRN units, um, and then we have a smaller subset of HOT 811 units, which are the ones that are, which where all of them are subsidized and they have some additional eligibility criteria. And those are managed by Jessica as well. Yeah. So we do we do have service partners um, currently in Cook um, Cook County. Um, it's interesting because uh, I heard a statistic from uh, another colleague, Stephanie Seidman, who you may be familiar with. She's worked for CSH for a while and has been instrumental with the 
um, statewide referral network. And I think she cited a, a, a statistic the other day that there's something like 10,000 applicants um, enrolled on the SRN um, in Chicago and Cook County. And there's 20,000, no, 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 what was that? And 2,000 in uh, Central and Southern Illinois. I might, I might have those numbers slightly off, but it's a very disproportionate number. That's really what the point of the story is. Yeah, especially Chicago. Like Chicago, there's so many ap uh, applicants in Chicago. Uh, relative. I mean, there are lots of units in Chicago as well, but it's relative. So the relative to the number of units, the number of uh, participants who want units in Chicago is much very high. Um, uh, but then sometimes, uh, you know, uh, it, people are willing to move from one county to another. We've had people moving from Evanston all the way to like um, Ogle County. They're requesting units in Ogle County, which is kind of north, but uh, northwest. Um, and uh, so people are willing to move between counties as well sometimes. Yeah. And I see quite a few people coming from Chicago down into my area because mm -hmm. there are available units. But yeah. to answer your question, we always welcome service partners. It doesn't matter where they're from. It, there's no such thing as, oh, we have too many service partners. We no, yeah, always yeah. welcome service partners. Yeah, yeah. And when Ronti, when Ronti referred to a turnover unit, I just wanted to explain there's new construction, which is a brand new building, right? It's never been occupied. And then turnover is just kind of as the name implies. It's units that have already been occupied. So maybe someone has had a lease there. They've left because their lease expired. That's called a turnover. It's ready for another occupant. Right. Yep. Yep. Thanks for clarifying. Karen. Sure thing. Any, any other questions? Karen, do you by chance have like um, an informational sheet on the counties that are, you know, that you're needing assistance with or whatnot from that list where it's not in the PowerPoint that we could share? I mean, I send out a newsletter and, you know, they could, you know, share it with their networks. Because I would I would be delighted to give you a listing <laughs> because I struggle daily trying to fill some of those units. I would be happy to share a list with you. Okay. Um, that you can, you are welcome to distribute. Right. Yeah. We can post that in our newsletter and just short sort of share, you know, if you have just like a little brief, you know, what you're looking for and, and we can put that in there too and share that with our members. Yeah. And one oh. of the great things that we do, actually, my colleague, Stephanie is the one that kind of produces this every month, every month. Um, I don't remember, Ronti, is at the beginning or end of the month? She produces a, a, a newsletter called Go Big or Go Home. And we, it's a listing of all the properties that we're still needing to fill. And right. those go out to all of our service partners. So mm -hmm. you can always see what's available. And also when you are when you become a registered user on the SRN, and again, I, I just need to say there is no cost for this. I don't think we've ever said that before, but I think we just presume people know that. Um, there is no cost to become a service partner. Um, uh, uh, Karen, I wanted to add something about the available SRN units list. That's a Google sheet that can be shared at any time. Stephanie mm -hmm. just does send out like a go big, go home email, just kind of reminding service partners, hey, we've got these units. And if you have, uh, but that Google sheet can be shared with service partners at any time. And the other thing I wanted to add is that if all of you on the call, if you are connected to service partners, if you uh, if there's a way you can virtually connect them to Karen, um, and and then we can maybe put together like a, a sort of a presentation more specific towards SRN uh, for them. Um, so that's something that I wanted to add. Yeah, great, Ranti. Um, also, when you're an SRN user, once you've signed your agreement form and you're a user. We have something called the Illinois Housing Search site that you can go on at any time at your leisure and you can see what properties are available and you can even zero in according to geographical area. So if you're looking in a certain region, you can go in and look uh, at available properties by that. You can look by unit size. Um, mm -hmm. It's really well defined. So it kind of makes your search um, very, very easy 
um, and something you don't need to kind of sit back and wait for a referral for. If you want to go on as a user and see what's out there, you're welcome to do that at any time. I, I wanted to add to that as well. So the Illinois Housing Search website is a, a public facing website, which uh, you can go on that at any time. Mm -hmm. But in order to access the SRN uh, portal, that's when you would need a user agreement completed with emphasis, and, and then you would have access to add your clients to uh, the SRN waitlist and get referrals and so on and so forth. But the Illinois Housing Search website is a great website. It's a public facing website where property managers list units and service partners go and find units by, you know, putting in different filters. Um, it, it's a great resource. Great. And Ranti, could you go to the next slide so we can just show yeah, some emails? Sure. Um, if you want to contact any of us, here's a listing of our emails. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and we'll get a copy of the uh, slide deck then at the... Yeah, I, I would also suggest, uh, you know, having the SRN at csh.org email handy because that sends an email to all four of us because sometimes we, you know, one of us may be on PTO or... Um, you know, whatever, but uh, if SRN at csh.org will send us an email to all four of us and any one of us can jump in with an answer or right. any kind of support. Great. Well, I'd just like to thank you all so very much. I want to be respectful of your time and I think we're kind of maybe a minute past, but thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today. We welcome your questions at any time. Feel free to reach out. Uh, we just really appreciate this. Thank you very much. Well, thank, thank you, you very much, everyone. Yes, thank you. And if you could share the slideshow, I'll send that out with the recording because um, I know that there were others that were registered, so something might have come up. So I'll make sure to get that out and then direct them to you guys um, with mm -hmm. any further questions. And if you do come up with a you know, document that I could include in the newsletter, that would be terrific. I'll be working on one actually next week. So um, okay. if you have anything, I'll be happy to share. I'll Fantastic. Send Awesome. Also, Jody, if you uh, if there are service partners in that central and southern Illinois area that you are aware of, um, if you can connect them to Karen as well, that would be highly appreciated. And we could put together a presentation or even in any part of Illinois um, uh, service partners that would be interested in uh, having their participants apply for housing via SRN. If they could be connected uh, to us, that would be great. Uh, yeah, as we well. can. We can do a more in-depth training on the SRN for yeah. specifically for users. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because our, you know, our network, they fund the providers out in the community. So they might have their own network, you know, they might want to do an individual. So we can share that, you know, with our yeah. members if they wanted to work with their own networks and have their own webinar or whatnot. Um mm -hmm. they certainly could do so so that their communities are aware of, of the services that you guys offer. So I think that's probably yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sounds great. All right. Well, thank you so much. And Quinette, thank you for being on here too. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you all. You. Bye bye. Okay. Good afternoon. Bye bye. Bye.